Hello and welcome to this special bonus edition of James Bond Radio. My name's Tom Sears and sadly I'm not joined by my good buddy Chris Wright this week because we've had to delay uh, what would have been this week's episode by a week. Uh, It's all my fault. I totally apologise. I know that's probably ruined your Friday. Uh, We were going to be talking about Octopussy this week, um, but uh, due to time zone issues, me being over in Thailand, Chris being in the UK, we just couldn't make it work. Um, So uh, we've had to put it back by a week, but don't worry, it'll be here next Friday. So I thought I'd knock together this little bonus episode for you just to keep you entertained, give you a little nugget to listen to on your Friday afternoon or over your weekend or whenever it is you're listening to it. So what we're going to be doing this week is we're going to be doing some bonus footage from good old Warren Ringham from Cue the Music, who, if you listened to last week's episode, he uh, broke down loads of the Bond songs for us and the Bond music and and all that kind of stuff. And it was very, very interesting. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, the Bond songs uncovered, make sure you go and listen to that. So we've got some bonus kind of uh, audio from Warren, and he's going to be talking about the John Barry sound. Like, what is that sound? What makes it sound like it it does? Um, Which is all very, very interesting. Now, before I pass you over to Warren, I've got some exciting Bond news for you. Oh my goodness me, George Lazenby, he's going to be doing a personal appearance in Oslo, Norway, to celebrate Honor Majesty's Secret Service. So I've got a little press release for you, here goes... George Lazenby, who played Ian Fleming's James Bond 007 in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, is to visit Oslo on September 1st, 2016, exclusively for the event James Bond in Oslo. Lazenby will fly direct from Los Angeles to attend the red carpet gala of the newly restored Bond classic On Her Majesty's Secret Service, showing in digital 4K. Lazenby will talk about his exciting and remarkable life and present the new documentary This Never Happened to the Other Fella, detailing his experience filming On Her Majesty's Secret Service. This historic visit marks Lazenby's first trip to Norway and also the first time a former 007 has visited Oslo. Lazenby says, I'm looking forward to visiting Norway for this very special event. I worked with Norwegian actress Julie Edge on the film and it will be interesting to present this restored version of Honor Majesty's Secret Service to a Norwegian audience, said Lazenby in a statement. More people have walked on the moon than played Bond. It says something about how unique this iconic role is. We are very happy that George Lazenby has chosen to come to Norway, says Morten Steengrimsen, who along with partners... Oh, goodness me. Odd Karlsnes and Oivind Asbjornsen has organised the event. There you go. I made it. So that's on September the 1st in Oslo, Norway. So if, you, uh, if you're if you in the in the area, make sure you go and, uh, go and check that out because that sounds like a bloody good day out. And if I didn't already have travel plans on that day, I'd have gone myself. So that's a shame I'm going to miss out. But if you can't make it, make sure you pop along and go and see George live in person. Okay, then one other little bit of news. Uh, If you haven't already, make sure you pick up your JBR t-shirts. They're only going to be available until July the 14th, so that's less than a week left uh, to grab your t-shirt. We've got all sorts of colours and different cuts. We've got v-necks, round necks, and all that kind of stuff going on. Cuts for the gentleman, cuts for the lady, all that kind of stuff. So uh, in order to get your t-shirt, head on over to jamesbombradio.com forward slash t-shirt. That's just the letter T and then S-H-I-R-T. Um, and like I say, only a week left or less than a week left now. So make sure you uh, jump on board with that and grab your T-shirt if you want one. OK, without any further ado, then let me pass you over to Warren Ringham from Q the Music, the world's greatest James Bond tribute band. Um, and we're going to learn all about what makes the John Barry sound. The James Bond sound, the John Barry sound. Two sentences that we hear so often, but what does it really mean? What are we actually talking about when we say that? Well, to understand it, we've got to go back to basics with music a little bit. So you're going to have to bear with me. I'll talk you through what's actually happening with John Barry's music and the James Bond sound um, from a basic level. And I'll try and show you some examples of how John Barry is using his colour and his sound to create the effect of the John Barry James Bond sound. When you're learning music, you get taught from a very early age, on a really basic level, that it's made up of two different chords, two sounds, a major chord and a minor chord. As children were told, it's a happy sound and a sad sound, because the major chord sounds very pleasant and happy, and the minor chord sounds very sad and dark. 
Now, that's pretty rudimentary, but bear with me because I'm going to go somewhere with this. If you take most pop songs, they are either in the major key or the minor key, and it's pretty basic, usually made up of three or four chords. That's going right back from before uh, James Bond times and even right up till now. Now, that's a bit of a general statement, but it's pretty fair to say that most pop tunes are made up of just basic chords. What they do usually is they add an extra note into that to that chord I've already played you, which sounds like this. It's just that note. For those that want to know, that's called a seventh. So that's really what pop music is. Where John Barry's different is he kind of breaks another basic rule uh, when you're learning music, which is you never write or want to have two notes that are right next to each other like this. You know, as you can hear, it's a very uncomfortable, edgy, nasty kind of sound. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have them next to each other. You can have them split by an octave, so you could have it like this. That's basically these two notes, just divided by an octave. Of course, now what you want to hear, naturally, every human expects it to go from this to this. That's the more pleasing sound on the ear. But John Barry constantly uses this, this awkward sound to create an effect, to create an edgy, mysterious, kind of unsettling sound in, in his scores. So, for example, if you just take an ordinary minor chord and add that extra note in, you've suddenly got a very, very edgy sound. If I put that in a completely different octave, it makes it sound even darker and more mysterious. It's the same chord, it's just down an octave. And what John Barry does quite often is he'll use lots and lots of bass end to really make it even darker. That's still that same chord with the seventh and just how he's orchestrated. But Looking at the James Bond chord and the, the sound that I think has influenced John Barry through a lot of his scores and really what set up the tone of the whole of this spy genre James Bond sound that everybody talks about. And I think it all stems from the final chord in the James Bond theme. Looking on it in quite a basic level, it's really two chords put into one. You have a minor chord... doesn't sound anything special on its own and a major chord as well separately it sounds like this again doesn't sound anything special on its own so you've got these two chords this and this put them together and you get this and of course that is the final chord for anybody who wants to know that's called an e minor major nine so that really sets the tone, I think, because it's so it's so dark and so edgy. You know, immediately it makes you go, whoa, that's unsettling. What's going on here? And of course, that's what you want when James Bond is lurking around or doing his sneaky stuff, as Tom always calls it. You need to be feel unsettled that he's in some kind of danger. And those sorts of sounds are what John Barry uses. He doesn't just use that chord, but of course, that chord is so quintessentially bond now you don't really hear it used very often anywhere else because as soon as you hear it it immediately takes you to james bond but one note we can change in that chord to give you another chord that gets used quite often if i change this note to this note and then you get this chord That's just called a minor nine, if you're interested. Now, that minor nine chord is actually the first and last chords that get played in Skyfall, albeit it is in a different key. That's the minor chord. If it was the James Bond chord, it would be this sound. But in the sound of Skyfall, it's this. So 
it's a very again a very dark chord it's a chord that Barry uses quite often in his incidental music you hear that quite a lot but again the James Bond chord from the end of the theme if I take away the top note just have the other notes it's just a minor chord with a major seven if anybody's interested in that but the actual sound of the chord again is something that you get you hear quite often it's still a very very edgy sound the reason being you've got these two notes next to each other and it's quite funny actually because quite often when i've played John Barry's music or the James Bond music in orchestras and other ensembles you'll find that you'll have in the orchestra someone somewhere's got this note and someone somewhere's got this note and of course they can hear themselves clashing and again you know the basic rule they think well I must have a wrong note and you'll see a hand go up and say to the conductor maestro um I think I've got a wrong note in my part and you can usually hear me at the back going no you morons that's the classic John Barry sound. Have a word with yourself. Another chord that he uses quite often, if you just take an ordinary, again, an ordinary chord, major chord, you can move one note, just one step, and it completely unsettles you and changes the sound of the chord completely. So all I've done is moved to that note. Yeah, everything else is the same. And you get this sound. Now, again, if I change the octave it's in, it gives it a completely different sound, and it sounds much more Barry. And uh, if I take it back again to the nice, pleasant major sound, change it one note again, this time down to this note. That's a diminished chord, it's called. If I take two notes from that chord, put them down the octave, and if you recognise that, I'll give you a clue, it's from Thunderball. Have a listen to this cue from Thunderball. So that's given you an idea of some of the chords that John Barry uses. Now, these chords are not actually exclusive to John Barry. They've been used in jazz for many decades before he uses them in the Bond songs and the Bond scores. But his influence and background from jazz is something he certainly brought into the film scores and the, the theme tunes that he writes. And it's I think it's fair to say they've not been used in that way at all before that time. And using those really colourful chords in his songs gave those all those James Bond songs their own sound. You've gone from having, you know, things like the Beatles songs, which are an amazing songs, but when you analyse them, they're very basic chords. The rudimentary chords that I said, you know, just with the seventh. You know, a lot of those pop tunes around there, that's all it is. But John Barry suddenly brought this sound with them with this extra seventh note. You know, he uses them in the in the pop songs and it completely changes the colour. And, you know, that's why you get that, that James Bond sound because it's the colour of those chords that gives it the sound. One final thing I'd like to say about the John Barry sound. I think if you had a debate about who is the greatest film composer of all time, most of the people listening to this now would say John Barry. No, def no doubt about it, John Barry. And I think you could probably throw in quite a few composers if you threw it out to the more general public. But it would come down to two. It would come down to probably uh, John Barry and John Williams. And I'm not going to give my opinion on that because I'm... Well, OK, I will give my opinion on that. You'd have to pin me down and torture me to make me make a decision over who I prefer. Um, they're They're different. They're so different, actually. You know, John John Williams is amazing at writing these massively scored, incredible tunes. If you say to him, go away and write a theme tune about, you know, a man in a fedora hat, you know, th th he's a genius at that. But if you said to John Barry, write some music to accompany an underwater scene, nobody does that better. But the one thing that John Barry wins hands down on, and he doesn't get enough recognition for it, is his orchestration and his scoring ability is absolutely sublime 
Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, when he sits down and writes something at the piano and writes a tune, which John Williams does as well, John Williams will write a short score. So he'll write a basic outline of what he wants and then somebody else will write it out for the orchestra for him. Now, I'm not doing John Williams a disservice here because clearly he would have a very large influence on what is scored where. But he's been doing that since the earlier Star Wars films. He has someone that scores his own it scores his music out for him. John Barry, throughout all of the early Bond, right up to View to a Kill, when Nick Rain took over and did his scoring for John Barry, up until that point, John Barry did all of his own writing, his orchestration. And if you listen, I mean, as I'm sure that you all regularly do, the the sound that he gets from the orchestra is just absolutely incredible. Just give you one example. I mean, you could talk about, you know, obviously the space music he writes for Yoni Twice and the space music he writes for Moonraker. It takes you straight there and you can take off what's going on the screen, remove it, and you're still going to go to those places with the sound that he creates because it invokes those images in your head. But just taking Thunderball as an example, if you take the cue The Bomb... Um, from the soundtrack there's a great little piano line in there which i'm sure you'll recognize it goes a little bit like this now, it's not brilliantly played but i'm not a piano player but here's a little bit of the cue now, listening to that when i used to hear that in the context of the film i used to think that that was a sound, a one-note sound that had been repeated over and over with an effect in the studio, maybe with some reverb, you know, something like that. And it wasn't until I actually heard the, the soundtrack isolated that I realised it was just a piano player playing that note with one finger and getting quieter through as it repeated. And John Barry's written that. And it, you know, it's just incredible writing, incredible scoring that he's taken that He's taken the ordinary sounds and instruments of an orchestra and created a sound that so instantly invokes images of underwater scenes. And he's done it without using any special effects. He's done it without using any synthesizers, any studio work. He's just taken an orchestra and said, right, what have I got to play with? How can I make it sound absolutely amazing? And he nails it. And it's... It's, he doesn't get the credit he deserves for that, I don't think. You know, and I know that as he's gone on, with much of Secret Service, he's used synthesizers and further along the line, you know, he uses the more modern sounds and effects as they go. And again, that's another great skill of his. But his orchestration in those early films in particular is just, it's just absolutely incredible. And if there's any debate over who's the greatest composer, film composer of all time, there's absolutely no doubt no debate as far as I'm concerned when it comes down to the orchestration and the scoring. John Barry is the clear winner. OK, great stuff. Now, cheers for that, Warren. Now, uh, cue the music. are going to be playing at the Hartlington in Fleet on November 27th. So if you haven't got tickets yet, make sure you grab some. Uh, they're available from the Harlington.co.uk. So spelling that out for you, that's T-H-E. H A R L I N G T O N dot co dot UK. Um, I know Chris is going to be there and loads of other JBR listeners are going to be there as well. Um, so if you fancy a good night out, then uh, make sure you go to see Cue the Music on November 27th. Now, at the end of the day, what else are you going to be doing on November 27th? Probably sitting at home with your feet up watching the telly with a cup of tea, which I do admit does sound actually quite appealing. But at the end of the day, when you can go and see the world's greatest James Bond tribute band play some amazing music and hang out with a load of Bond fans and JBR listeners, you know, there's no real comparison there, is there? So that's November 27th at the Harlington in Fleet. Make sure you grab your tickets from the harlington.co.uk. Okay, that's all from me. Don't forget to grab your JBR t-shirts before it's too late. Remember, they're only going to be available until July 14th. Uh, head on over to jamesbondradio.com forward slash t-shirt. That's just the letter T, then S-H-I-R-T. Um, and you can grab your T-shirts now. Good stuff. So uh, if you're following along with us at home, make sure you get your octopus on in time for next week because we'll be back um, and we're going to be talking about Roger's penultimate Bond film, which is going to be very, very exciting. All right, guys, see you next week. Uh-huh.